Let us pray again. Gracious Lord, thank you that we are yours. And that what you have sown in us is good. Gifts from your spirit, a new nature in Christ Jesus. Open our hearts and minds to that which is good that you have worked in us. That we might be those who shine in the glory of their Father and know your everlasting love and goodness. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Do you all have a prayer book that you can see near you? If you do, I'm not sure everybody does, but if you do, I want you to turn, please, to page 231. 231. What this is, is the prayer for the day. I want us to say it all together. I said it at the beginning, but I want us to say it all together, and I want to pick it apart and explain a little bit about how it relates to the scriptures that we have for this morning. Where we are is proper 11. It says the Sunday closest to July 20th, which is today, the closest to the 20th. And so this, the collect is in fact meant to set a theme, a theme for the day, that in essence explains some of what's within the content of the lessons. And so that's exactly what I want to do this morning. So the first thing I want us to do is read it together. So let's do that. Almighty God, the founder of all wisdom, you know our necessities before we ask, and our ignorance in asking. Have compassion on our weakness, and mercifully give us those things which is for our unworthiness we dare not, and for our blindness we cannot ask, through the worthiness of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. All right, let's take it apart. The first thing it does is that it says something about God. That's the first phrase. Almighty God, what does it call him? The fountain of all wisdom. In other words, God knows exactly what he's doing. We can trust him. He has access to wisdom that we don't have. And a part of it, the way that gets shaped in this collect is, he has access to wisdom about us that we don't have. That's, in fact, the key, one of the key things this call like to say. In other words, God is doing things in us. God is doing things for us. God is doing things with us that in his estimation are tremendously wise, even though we may or may not see it. Because if you'll notice, wisdom is not one of the adjectives used to describe us in this collect. It instead is used to describe him. And that's, that's number one, so we're getting authority straight. Who's wiser than we are? God is. You know. He is the fount of all wisdom. I'm not. That's not something that our culture is saying. It's something that we're saying very, very clearly. Our culture is saying, I'm smart enough to figure all this out for myself, and I don't really need anybody's help. And if I learn how to stand on my own two feet, you'll applaud and I'll get my life together. And you'll cheer. And if I'm not, they'll say, what's wrong with you? It was within you. Why didn't you get it? See, that's what the culture says. We're saying something very, very different. We begin by acknowledging the fact that the fount of all wisdom, meaning the spring that never, ever stops, is actually God. And that's where we start. He, God, is the fount of all wisdom. And so, because he is, he knows everything about us. Remember, Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known. In other words, he knows everything that there is about us. You know our necessities. You know what it means. Even in Jesus, one of the wonders of this is that we can never stand and look up because God sent his, his son into the world in the likeness of human flesh. In other words, fully human. We can never go to God and say, you don't know what it's like down here. <laughs> he does. First-hand experience, you see. And so he knows our necessities, as the colic says. 
He knows our desires. He knows our needs. He knows all about our finances. He knows all about our relationships. He knows about our job. He knows about how we are or are not getting along with other people. He, he knows what it means to be human in a very, very real and personal way. So that means he knows our necessities. When? Before we ask. In other words, God has a better beat on us than we have of ourselves. So he says, you know our necessities before we ask and our ignorance and asking. Now, what this does not mean is I shouldn't be asking because I'm too dumb to ask anyway. That's not what it's saying. But what he is saying is, is that we operate from a position of ignorance about ourselves. We don't have the whole picture. It is not possible, in other words, for me to sort of treat myself like this font where I could, you know, turn it over and figure out how it's made and understand the nature of the material. I, I can't know myself like that. I can't stand outside of myself and view myself objectively as an object, right? I mean, I'm too wrapped up in my own experience of me, which may or may not be entirely accurate. I mean, a part of what we're admitting in this collect is my perceptions of myself are probably not 100% accurate. And the only person who's got that bead on me is God. Right? Are you willing to admit that? Yes. All right. That's what we're meaning here. In other words, it's not that I'm not supposed to ask, but there's always going to be a misshapen nature to what it is that I ask of God, even for the basics around my necessity. So I'm not only trusting God to provide, and this is what this collect is saying, I'm actually trusting God to give me what I need as opposed to some of the things that I might want, which may or may not be good for me. You get the distinction, right? Hello, are we here? Um, and so I'm trusting God, in other words, to take whatever prayer that I pray and shape it in such a way that I am shaped. Because that's really what we're asking, what we need in the end, is for God to shape us. Does that make sense? Hello? Yeah. So, have compassion, notice, on our weakness, and mercifully, in other words, even though I don't deserve it, oh God, I'm asking for your mercy to give us, me, those things for which our, my unworthiness I dare not ask. In other words, I'm facing the fact that inside of me there's enough brokenness that if somehow the annals of justice were actually laid out, God might look at me and say, oh, I don't know that you deserve that. You see, that's unworthiness. But the promise is, is that we're asking God to give us the things that we, he, we really need, even though we don't necessarily deserve them. Right? right. On our weaknesses. Mercifully, in other words, mercifully give us what those things for which our unworthiness we dare not. In other words, I'm not sure I can ask for that. That's too big for me. And that says something about the generosity of God. A part of the very nature of a God who loves us and pours out his life on us is that he always gives us things that we don't deserve. That's the nature of his gifts. Or for our blindness, we can't see the thing that we really need. Give us the things that we can't see that we really need. And for our blindness, we cannot ask. Why in the world should God do that? Through the worthiness of your son. In other words, do you know that Jesus prays for you? It says in the book of Hebrews that Jesus is literally in heaven making intercession, to quote Hebrews, for you. In other words, even if you feel like nobody's praying for you, even if you feel like I don't know how to pray about myself, the fact of the matter is, is that even in those times of profoundly desperate loneliness, where I feel like I don't have anybody I can count on at all, Jesus himself, who knows exactly what it means to be human, is praying and interceding for me. So, and, and so it's like, 
It would not be out of line, in other words, to say, God, I'm in pretty desperate straits. And even though I'm in this mess because I did this in fact to myself, and even though because that's true, I probably don't deserve to get out of this mess, would you listen to Jesus' prayers about this? I don't even know how to pray. But would you listen to his prayers? Well, of course, you see. God always listens to the prayers of his son. Now, so, the God of all wisdom, we're asking him who knows everything and is smarter about us than we are about ourselves. We're asking God to give us the things that we actually don't deserve because he loves us and it's out of his mercy that he does that. And that he do that even though we're not worthy of it all. Why? Because Jesus is praying for us and he is always worthy. And he's the one who speaks forgiveness and life to us. Do you follow? Does that all make sense? Okay. That's exactly what we see laid out in these scriptures. Here's Jacob. Jacob had just swindled his brother out of his inheritance. If there was anybody that didn't deserve anything from God, it was Jacob. And yet, the story that we read this morning in the Old Testament lesson is that Jacob, on the run, you see that the family's after him on the run, experiences this extraordinary vision from God. Angels coming up and down, a ladder from heaven, literally opening up heaven right in the midst of Jacob in his dream. God is in this place, he said. Did Jacob deserve that? Absolutely not, you see. I mean, you should read the story of Jacob and go, oh God, that means there's hope for me. <laughs> Seriously. Oh God, let, at least there's hope for me. The same thing is true in the Romans reading. That what God has planted within us in the midst of the difficulties of what Paul would call our, call our flesh. And what does he mean by that? He's talking about desire. He's talking about the brokenness of the human body. Most people don't talk about that until they hit, hit at least 65. But the body breaks down, right? So in the midst of the weaknesses of our flesh, there's both a nature that desires what we know is wrong, but we still want it anyway, right? Follow me. We're all in this room together. Yes. We desire the things that we know are bad for us because of pleasure, and we live in a body that no matter how much time we spend around exercise and nutrition, it's inevitably going to start to break down when we get old. It's what it is. In the midst of all of that, God has given us something that this body and my will certainly does not deserve. And that is, that is His Holy Spirit, His nature. Something that's implanted inside of me that says, I belong. In the bliss of which it says, I cry, Abba. Which means, what? Father. Literally, actually, even Dad. In other words, because I have, been, I have been given something that I entirely do not deserve. I'm included into the family, and I have the right to call the Lord of heaven and earth, Dad. That's what's happening in baptism, you see. This good, powerful gift that God plants within a human soul. Not because he or she deserves it at all, but only because God loves us and he wants us to be in union with himself. He gives us a thing that we do not deserve, for which we are not worthy, but because he loves us, that's exactly what he does. It's exactly what he does. The same thing about the story of the, of the kingdom. If you'll notice, and you know this if you ever do any gardening, weeds are almost always stronger than plants. <laughs> The weeds are tough. And if you let the weeds take over, they just choke the plants out completely. And, and so you can see that the gardeners who work for the master really want to find a way to be able to dig the weeds out. But the gardener, but the owner is so concerned about those little seedlings that he doesn't want anything to get in the way. And he said, gosh, if, if you get rid of the weeds now, you might actually take out some of the seedlings. I don't want that to happen. So let's let it all go together. Uh, believe me, the, the, the wheat's going to be just fine. And then we'll do, divvy out at the end. We'll divvy it all out at the end. Well, you see, what he's talking about is you and me. That's what the explanation says. 
But the explanation says is that you're wheat if you belong to Jesus. If you belong to Jesus, you're wheat. Say it out loud, I'm wheat. I'm wheat. I'm wheat. In other words, what's not going to happen is that you're not going to be picked up and thrown into the fire. Are we there? Are you okay with that? Do you understand? Okay, so I'm wheat. And God is so committed, even if I'm a wheat that struggles, that God is going to make sure that I get there in the end. He is going to take care of me. And there will be a time when I stand in the kingdom of heaven where I literally in that moment am going to shine in the glory of my Abba, my Father. In other words, what God has planted within my soul, even in the midst of all of my weakness, even in the midst of all of my struggles, God's going to take care of me and He's going to see me through to the end, even though I don't deserve it. Now you see, that's exactly what we're acting out today. God pouring into people who don't deserve it all that they need for them in the end to stand before God shining like the sun. It's incredibly realistic. It takes into the fact that there really is, there are weeds. Life's hard. We don't all we deserve it. We wrestle. It is not easy. How many of you know it's not easy? Okay. That's right. In other words, we can be realistic here about the struggles. We don't have to act like we're good all the time. I hate that in church. Everybody pretends. This should not be a place where you pretend. Because we understand in a very, very profound way. We can be open about the fact that we are sinners, that we are broken, that we sometimes give in to desires that are wrong, and that if, if it were a matter of justice, I might not even be standing here right now, you see. But God is a God of mercy. He loves us. He is committed to us. So that even if we're one of those tender weed shoots that's struggling to make it out in the midst of the weeds, God is going to make sure that we get there. That's how much He cares about us. Give us those things. Oh, even for our unworthiness we dare not or for our blindness cannot ask. And God's answer to that prayer is, I will and that's what he does. So believe me, if you're in a fellowship, if you're here this morning, and what you're doing is you're here, is saying, even in your heart of hearts, oh, I thank God I'm not like them. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome to the club of sinners. <laughs> but not just any sinners. Sinners who God has called wheat and who has put into our hearts something that we do not deserve but are absolutely desperate to have. And that is the gift of His Holy Spirit that allows us to know that I belong, that I'm included in the family, and that I have the right and the privilege to call God my Father who loves me. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, I thank You that when it comes to the scale of worthiness or unworthiness, you wipe that off the table. You see us exactly as we are, and you give us what we need. And so, Lord, we do, trusting that we are not being rejected, open our hearts to you and ask that you would pour into us all that we need to be able to serve you and grow into the full wheat that you want us to be. Thank you for your patience for your kindness, and for your forgiveness. And thank you most of all that you have made us your own and that you will never, ever let us go. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, now we're going to do baptism.